Okay, so as you can see, I've got a nice crop of a uh, pumpkin forest. And even though these pumpkins were frozen, I'm still getting um, <laughs> seeds sprouting everywhere. But that's okay, the worms will eat the sprouts too. So I'm just gonna unplug those and put them down at the end where the feedings are gonna be. And then we're going to harvest just a little bit more today and try and keep things going. Now I've left this bottom half over here uncovered so it can dry out a little bit more. Um, so <laughs> let's get going on that and I will start answering your questions. Uh, question number one was how long does it take to establish the, the wedge system? Now, I would say that if you are talking about um, wanting to get it to where it's harvestable, I would say you need to give it at least six months or longer, uh, minimum. Because basically what you want to do is you want to make sure that this end of the bin is drying out, is done uh, composting, and also the cocoons have started to hatch and the worms have left. Now, because I have used this as a area to dry out other bins, um, I've kind of screwed up my own wedge here, but uh, do as I say, not as I do, right? And um, so what is basically happening here is I'm, I'm just trying to sift out what I can, and then I'm gonna put this back at the other end, which is what I do anyway, but this was from a different bin. So we're going to see a greater concentration of worms at this end where we would not normally. So the whole purpose of the, the wedge system is to let the worms finish up, let them get hatched, and then let the compost finish before you harvest it. So it takes about six months uh, for this bin, which is about a foot deep, um, to get everything finished. And also the worms to leave for the most part. I'm finding more worms at this end right now because of the things that I've done, if this was a normal system of wedge, you would not see any worms at this end. They would have already left. So it is unusual to find worms at this end of the system. But if you don't want to wait that long, you're just going to end up recycling more stuff like this and putting it back at the beginning if you start harvesting too early, which is totally fine. It's up to you. You run your system the way you want to, but under ideal conditions, the wedge system should start paying dividends in about six months to a year. Uh, another question was, why did I uh, take two ends of a half barrel and put them together as opposed to just uh, using a half a barrel? It, to get the wedge system to work really good, you do need a longer period of time to allow the, the finishing portion to happen. And so what I'm noticing in the European Nightcrawler bins, so if you haven't seen that video or series, I have European Nightcrawlers in a proper half of a barrel. And uh, it's what it's turning out to is it's a bit of a learning curve for me too because it's a lot less room, well, half the room that I have here in blue. And I probably shouldn't feed it as much or I should have more narrow additions to give the other ones time to finish up. Because what I'm finding right now is that my percentage of harvest out of that half barrel is, is not as great. So it, it's going to take a little bit of time for me to figure out how to work a half barrel after having done this first. But that's why I did it, was to get um, as large of an area as possible so that the wedge system would be more efficient. As I'm harvesting these, I am putting them in the bucket that I 
um, showed you last time that we were in here. So if you haven't seen the last video for Blue where I explain how I take care of my castings long term, I will link that at the end so that you can go back and watch that. Uh, so I am putting all of these castings in that place. And I have been coming in and, and making sure to add water. It took almost a gallon of water due to the, the furnace being on constantly last time, or last month. So that's one thing that you have to do is keep an eye on those castings and make sure that they stay wet so the biology stays alive. Okay, so that is enough of the uh, harvesting for right now. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this over and make sure that this end, the finished end, is keeping a, you know, homogeneous moisture. And if I see any big sticks, I, I toss it down there. So what I'm doing here, which is what I do about once a month, is I will basically turn the entire thing over, making sure that I get air to the deeper parts of the bin. And also evaluate, are the worms all moving out? In the case of this, I'm just going to have to suck it up and deal with it because I, I did it to myself by adding all those extra bins castings on top because there were worms there and there were cocoons. And they did, uh, you know, start hatching out. I'm not seeing worms at this end, which is not typical. Normally when I'm working at this far end, I don't see any worms at all. So it's probably going to take a couple of months to get the wedge straightened out again to where it's uh, normal, where I'm not seeing little hatchlings, etc. at this end of the bin. Because as long as the moisture stays good, the hatchlings, or the, the cocoons will hatch. Uh, we're having a little bit of a warm snap again, so it's probably almost 70 degrees Fahrenheit in the basement. So the worms are not going to have any problems whatsoever hatching. So I'm just going to mound that up and keep fluffing as I go. So one of the questions was, how do I not come in here all the time and play with my worms? <laughs> At the beginning of my worm career, I don't know if you want to call it a career, but in the beginning, uh, I probably did. I'll have to admit that I probably peeked in on them a lot more than I should have. But nowadays, I have a lot of other things to do. Uh, I got a new job in 2021. And basically, it is a, a more complicated position than I've had previously. So that is a, a longer work hour, longer work day than usual. And then also, I have a lot of other hobbies. I uh, have my orchids and my bonsais. I also read quite a bit. I share with you some of the, the nuggets that I find in the vermiculture and ecology, soil ecology books that I read. Um, let's see, what else do I do? Oh yeah, the channel. <laughs> so the uh, Plant Obsessed Worm channel actually is, is more like a, a part-time job. It takes me about 30 hours a week to do the research um, on the different topics that I bring up, as well as preparing the script, uh, doing the uh, videography, which is what I'm doing right now. Then also there's the editing and all of the prep that goes into that. So I probably spend another, you know, 30 hours a week working on my channel and also you know hopefully getting better skills as far as uh learning how my camera works a little better and also you know how to do education videos a little bit better so i do a lot of that so that kind of sucks up a lot of time that i might be tempted to come down here and play with my worms of course i have the african night crawlers on the main floor with the people and so honestly, if somebody's going to get peeked in more often, it's probably going to be them. They get looked in on about once a week right now, trying to make sure that I'm controlling the moisture properly. And uh, so far, so good. My plans are working. The, the uh, seed mat is keeping them nice and warm. And then I'm adding probably a half a gallon or two liters of uh, water to it every week to keep the moisture up in there. It's a little bit compacted under here. 
So I'm gonna have to pause my brain and let my, my muscles do the work here for a second. Yeah, that's why I only do this about once a month. It is kind of rough to go in here and do this. I'm hoping I'm not hurting the worms. I try to be as gentle as possible. That's why I do it with my hands and I don't do it with a tool. So that I can kind of feel my way around. Yeah, but inevitably, you know, it is possible worms might get injured. But the good thing about worms is that they can regenerate um, if they're damaged. So if you, if a worm has a, an accident, a physical accident where maybe it gets its tail cut off or something, then uh, it can grow it back. Uh, according to the, the books that I've read, uh, as long as it's not more than 50%, they can usually regenerate under good conditions. I would say this bin's a good condition, so if I accidentally pop a tail off a worm, not ideal guys, I'm not doing this on purpose. But if it happens, uh, the worm can grow back um, if it does happen. All right, let's slide the camera down. Okay, here we are at the newest end. Start pulling these sprouts and moving them down here. And then this would be the part that I fed maybe two months ago. So two, this is two feedings ago. So you're gonna see that there's recognizable leaves in here. Um, pumpkin seeds have been sprouting. Let's see what else we can find in here. Just gonna also fluff this up. Since the bedding, which was leaves that time, is uh, relatively new, it's staying pretty airy. It's when it gets really, really worked over that you start having the compaction problems. So you can tell the, the leaves are degrading and they are getting a little bit more compacted in here. Everything smells nice and earthy. Nothing's, you know, smelling funky. Last time we gave them a really big feeding because, you know, I was, you know, I'm starting to get concerned about the holding capacity of this bin. You know, how many worms can I put in here? and uh, not damage their, I don't know, health or people were talking about reproductive rates and uh, will they stop reproducing if there's too many worms. And that's pretty, pretty clear in the, the research that I've done is that if the bin is overpopulated, they will stop reproducing. But this is a pretty big bin. I'm hoping that uh, I have given them enough room I really need to get to that middle. So that was one of the, the questions was, you know, do I think after having had Blue consume all those different bins recently, do I think that I'll be getting to the, the carrying capacity of the bin? And the question or the answer is, I don't have any idea. Um, if I stop seeing little worms, and I just start seeing big worms, then I, then I will have the answer and we'll learn together as it happens. But I, I don't really know what the carrying capacity of a 55 gallon bin is. At least not in the way that, you know, I'm taking care of it. These are strings from my compost bags that I make my worm tea out of. They still are taking a bit longer. The bag itself is completely gone, but that, uh, the little rope that was being a drawstring is still still alive there. Must be made out of a tougher kind of cotton. So talking about pest issues, people had asked me, you know, what pest problems have I seen? And uh, what's my experience with uh, what do I have and what have I done about it? I've only had a couple of different things that were troublesome. I would say that the, was it two or three years ago, I had a rat in the basement. I have no idea how something, it must have come in when it was little, how it would have got in here. But um, that was a problem because mice you can trap pretty easy. I have uh, something called a tin cat, which is basically just a, uh, it's a mouse trap. They go in, they can't get out. 
that kind of thing. And uh, usually with mice, you know, that's how I get rid of them. But the rat was different. That thing uh, managed to stay down here for three or four months and I actually had to disassemble Blue and put him in buckets to save the worms. Because it was in here rummaging um, and trying to eat my babies. Uh, let's see, other things I have, uh, because I use leaves, sometimes it carries in um, beetle larva. And I did find like what looked like a staghorn beetle. Uh, put in the comments below, uh, <laughs> do they eat worms? I don't know. Looked pretty obnoxious like a big beetle. So I took it back outside, let him do whatever he's supposed to do in the wild. Um, so I took him out. Uh, but other than that, I really haven't experienced any. In my reading recently, I have discovered that there's a certain kind of fly that is actually in the United States, even in my area, that can parasitize a worm. So I guess that, you know, like if a worm's out, it comes by and it flies on it and pokes it, and then the babies are inside the worm. Uh, I have no idea if that has ever happened. Uh, but I did, when I read that, I put up some more fly traps just in case. Uh, tried to look at the picture of the weird fly that parasitizes earthworms in particular, but it didn't seem to look a whole lot different than any other kind of like house fly or whatever. So it freaks me out, but I put out more traps and that's all I can do. Um, except for maybe put like a covering on here to try and protect the worms from anything that might be flying around. All right, I think I'm gonna have to move this in order to get to the fresh stuff. We'll have to put it back. Because the top does dry out a little bit, and I'm fine with that, because that does act like a buffer to uh, any sort of flying insects that might, you know, be flying around going, you know, hey, is that something interesting I want to get involved in? So the dry stuff on the top does actually help in that way. Okay, so the, the next question was, do I ever think that my worm castings will 100% um, prevent me from using any sort of uh, fertilizer. And I don't think so. I, um, I love it too, uh, but there's different ways that I can uh, try and reduce it. Um, but the soil that I have around here has been in agriculture for probably hundreds of years. The thing that makes worm casting so valuable is the microbes. It's not the NPK and the microbes actually get into the soil and they break down existing nutrients for the plants. If those nutrients aren't there in their raw material, then the worm's little microbe friends, they can't extract it from the soil. So I still think I will be adding, you know, I try to do the natural way of doing things. Like uh, when I have worm tea, I go and I ha add um, seaweed extract. I add azomite to the worm tea to kind of boost the nitrogen and the micronutrients. And then also for the large fruit trees, the one year that I did not use anything but worm castings, I got like a quarter of the harvest. It might have just been the light year in the cycle, or it might just not have been enough. So I went ahead and I, I still give each one of the um, full-size apple trees a bag of 10-10-10. Uh, if anybody knows what there is for a, um, a substitute for large um, trees like that, put that in the comments below. All right, we're getting to the part where we fed last time. So if we're lucky, we will get a worm ball. I feel something squishy in here. Oh, you know, I think I put that, that's where the avocados went. So there we go. Well, the avocado has turned into mush, but uh, there are the worms that were associated with the avocados and it continues, hold on. Some people were also asking, you know, I thought worms balling up was bad and it meant that they were unhappy and that, whoop, that they were um, fleeing something terrible. That, that is absolutely a possibility, but in this situation, it's a feeding, a feeding frenzy, kind of like sharks, only adorable and squishy. Um, yeah, so these guys aren't balling up because they're unhappy about some part of anything. They're here for the super awesome avocado. They're not uh, fleeing something. Now, I, I do believe that if you go back and look at my meat experiment, that you will see 
one of those situations where they the worms were actively avoiding the meat area and that uh, they were balled up away from the food. So I think that's the only time I have ever seen worms actively balling up in an attempt to uh, get away from something. I think that's the only time I've ever seen that. But uh, yeah, so there we go. The avocado was a big hit. So we're still seeing the evidence of the avocado there and quite a few worms. So let's keep going. Look at that, isn't that crazy? Look how big that is. Okay, let me move the camera one more time. Okay, here we are at the very corner of the bin and I'm seeing quite a bit of springtails down here. I experience springtails more. Um, ooh, look at that. One of my uh, avocado trees died this winter, so I've got an opening. Keep going, little dude. Okay, so that one's going too. You're a hoss. I don't need more hosses. So let's see what we can find in the way of a worm ball down at the feeding end. There's the lasagna noodles. Okay, peppers. Looks like they are getting into the peppers. And these were Anaheim peppers. Uh, according to the books, worms do not feel the capsation, similar to humans or dogs or um, other things. So they physically don't have the correct uh, body parts to feel capsation. Oh, I'm looking for that. So looks like we still got some peppers. Still got some onions. That's a red pepper. Let's dig in here and see if there's anything else. Oh, more avocado pits. More avocado pits. So the big worm ball that we saw last time has been disbanded. But uh, I'm willing to bet we're gonna get it back next time because of the meal that they are going to get today. Yeah, that's all kind of diffused. It's not like a proper, proper worm ball there. But they did give me a super awesome worm ball for my birthday, which was the last video. Uh, so, you know, I can't get one every time. Okay, so let's move everybody over just a little bit. And let's put that cardboard down and get them a little feeding. I don't see any food left, but I, I truly am running out of room here. So let me get their food. So the last question that was asked of me was, what was the best thing about 2022? And uh, what were my, my biggest wins or the most awesome thing for 2022? Okay, so for 2022, I would say that uh, the bucket list trip where my husband and I went to France and Italy, uh, you know, never mind the fact that I got, you know, stuck over there with COVID, but the trip itself, that was a bucket list that we had been planning for like 20 years. So that was definitely one of the best things about this year. The second thing is I, I told you earlier that I, I had a new job in 2021 and um, as of you know, just probably in the last six months, we have assembled a really amazing team of kind, brilliant, caring individuals that just work like a Swiss clock. Um, honestly, they are the best and it makes going to work enjoyable. And uh, I can say that I have probably not experienced that in my life where I was like, I love the people that I work with and they're great. And so for that, I am truly grateful. It's, you know, really amazing when a team comes together. And I would say that it's, it's great that my son lives locally and that I get to spend a lot of time with him and my husband and that they, they share my goals for sustainability and um, environmental responsibility. And last but not least, you guys. 
my worm family, the worm channel community with everybody else. And just the, the community of worm people is amazing. If you go on any other kind of channel about anything, the people in the comments are really nasty and horrible to each other. And you don't see any of that with our worm people. And I think that just is like the most amazing thing that our community is truly a community and I am I'm super grateful about that because when I read your comments or if I'm on your vis videos and I'm reading other people's comments it really brightens my day and you know even though I have a worm channel I learn equally as much from you guys as I try and put out there for everybody else so from the bottom of my heart thank you for hanging out with me and my worms